welcome everybody. Am I on here? I don't think I'm on. Am I on? Barely. Barely? Tim? Am I on now? All right. Thank you. Well, welcome. Welcome to the annual Distinguished Lecture in Law, Technology, and the Arts. My name is Craig Nard, the founding director of the center. Uh, this lecture, historically, uh, but particularly over the last several years, has been used as a vehicle to feature some of the law school's uh, most prominent alums, and uh, this year is no exception. It's, it's my pleasure to welcome George Kellard, a graduate uh, of the law school in 1992. Uh, George currently is the senior vice president uh, for legal and business affairs for the Weather Channel Communications in Atlanta. Uh, and, and prior to that, as we said five, five days ago, just prior to that, <laughs> held the, the same position for NBC uh, Universal in, in New York. Uh, and, and in that role, and it's a role that will carry over to his responsibilities in Atlanta, it's so lengthy I just have to read what one man is responsible for because I, I can't get over this. Um, Multi-channel video programming, including negotiation, review, and drafting of programming license and retransmission consent agreements for cable. IPTV, broadband and wireless platforms, as well as drafting and negotiation of marketing and advertising agreements, technology and software licensing agreements, high technology equipment purchases, customer agreements, asset purchase agreements with both high growth startup and mature organizations. Uh, that's extraordinary. And, and, and all of that you'll continue to do uh, for the Weather Channel companies. Prior to uh, NBC Universal, George held a high level uh, position with AT&T, uh, Ameritech, um, and as he told us this afternoon to uh, a group of students, got his start in Wichita, Kansas. And, and from there um, made his way finally to Atlanta uh, where the Weather Channel uh, waits him in uh, a few days. It's with great pleasure that I welcome George Kellard. Hold the applause till after I'm finished, right? Uh, thank you very much, Greg, I appreciate that. Uh, that's right, I am, what is it, Thursday? Four days into my stint at the Weather Channel companies. Uh, I've been on calls and they're asking me all sorts of questions and, you know, generally know the answer, but I don't really know what I'm doing yet, so I gotta, I gotta figure this out. But I wanted to take some time off before I really got going there and, and, uh, and join Craig and, and uh, folks out here to, to just share with you some of what I do and what I have done um, at NBCU at the Weather Channel. And before I get going, um, let me just say this, the, here's the disclaimer, anything that I'm sharing with you cannot or should not be anyway attributed to NBCU or the Weather Channel or any other company I might have worked for. Uh, these are just my personal thoughts, views, speculations. I mean, we'll go through some you know, legal regulatory stuff and uh, you know, certainly the law speaks for itself, but, but I'll probably editorialize and offer some comments, but that's, I'm just, it's just me talking. So, uh, so with that, I had, uh, I had talked earlier to a group of students, and I, I know many of you are practicing lawyers as well, and, and so I will try and stick really kind of to, to the legal stuff, but uh, I had spoken to a group of students earlier today and, and uh, was explaining to them what I do, and, and uh, so for them, I'm probably being a little repetitive, but essentially what, what I do is really the, the guts of what a, a cable programmer like NBCU or Disney or Fox or you know, any Viacom, you know, uh, what they do, they sell their programming, right? And they sell their programming to cable operators, satellite providers, telephone companies such as AT&T and Verizon who are in the video business, as well as to wireless providers. Uh, and now, you know, to a certain extent, and, and as we get through this lecture, you'll see even more, online video providers are what are now being called OVDs. Um, that's really where kind of the rubber hits the road, right? I mean, that's, that's the guts of the business. You're creating the programming to sell it, uh, and in turn, the cable operators then sell it to their customers, and that's where the money is made. So let me just kind of explain to you, before we dig into all the legal stuff, kind of on a daily basis, what I might do. I mean, uh, Craig read a whole bunch of things there, and, and yeah, I kind of have done those things, but, but what really I focus on is the transaction, and that is the sale of the programming, the licensing of the programming to the satellite 
uh, the cable operators and so forth. And let me just say this. Instead of always saying cable, satellite, and telco, I'm just going to call them all cable operators. So you, you all know what I'm talking about. It's, it's essentially the same multi-channel platform, but we'll just call them cable operators. So uh, it's transactional work and it's rights issues, right? I mean, it's the, the right to the programming, to the music, to whatever comprises the programming. That's, that's really what this is all about. And on a daily basis, uh, there could be any number of negotiations going on. Uh, there are perhaps 10 really large cable slash satellite providers, and then there are still probably a thousand or so small cable companies in America that are operating. They may have 100, 200, 300, maybe 5,000 subs, um, and we still have to negotiate with them. Uh, luckily, most of them purchase their programming through big buying groups, uh, cooperatives. So. Uh, we focus most of our attention on the really large providers. So uh, let's just kind of dig into uh, a negotiation and, and, and talk about what, what that's all about. As I said, it's the, uh, it's the licensing of, of the programming. And you know, 20 years ago when I got into this business, these negotiations were really very straightforward. I mean, they, they, they might be over in a week um, because you really negotiated just two things, the price, you know, what am I going to pay for that programming? And the other thing you negotiate was, where am I going to be carried on your cable system? And cable was a very simple technology to a certain extent back then. There was a basic tier and an expanded basic tier. And so the question was, am I going to be on basic so that all 100% of your customers see my service, or am I going to be on expanded basic? Which might reach 95% of the customers, so it's still pretty good. But that's really all you discussed, the price and where you would be carried. Now the negotiations have evolved, and, and they've evolved because technology has evolved. And uh, it's not so straightforward. Um, and moreover, it's evolved because there's now competition, right? I mean, we all can remember 20 years ago when it was the cable company. That's it. That's where you got your video. Now it's satellite. Now it's telco. Now it's wireless. Now, to a certain extent, it's online. So the, the negotiations have gotten a lot more complex. So when a, when a cable operator sits down to negotiate, they're looking for the rights to the programming, right? But what else are they looking for? They're looking for things like being able to take your content and within the home, allow a customer to move the content around so that if I'm watching TV downstairs, I ought to be able to go upstairs and on my PC watch that very same programming. Or I ought to be able to press the DVR in my living room, record a program, and maybe later on I'll go upstairs, lie in bed, and watch it on the TV upstairs without having to have two DVRs. That's, that's an issue that, that we're now dealing with. Um, another thing that the, the cable operators are looking for are TiVo-like services. You know, right, you can pause your programming, you can, you know, uh, go back in time. Um, they're looking for those kinds of rights as well, right? I mean, it's, it's very attractive to a customer. Um, another thing that we face are what I'm going to call squeeze backs and overlays. So if you'll picture your TV screen, um, you know, and you all have seen this when you press the button that says programming guide on your remote, right? Your, your picture squeezes back and the programming guide pops up there. Uh, perhaps some of you have on your remote control a little button that says widgets or something like that. You press that and all sorts of data might pop up. Maybe it's weather, maybe it's traffic information, maybe it's horoscopes, whatever it is. So squeeze backs and overlays are another issue that we deal with. And I, I'll get into these in a little more detail, but I'm just kind of at high level running through. Um, another thing that uh, a cable operator would ask for, on-demand rights. Right? My, my consumers aren't always home at 7 p.m. or 8 p.m. to watch it. Right? Like a DVR, I ought to be able to make it available, time shift the program, right? I mean, I ought to be able to make it available for them to watch whenever they want. So, so we deal regularly with on-demand issues. Um, another issue is streaming, right? Streaming on the internet. What, what, what does that mean? Cable operators may want some, some streaming rights, uh, and, uh, but typically the issue that we confront is the cable operators are seeking to restrict a programmer from streaming their programming, right? Cable operator is paying a lot of money for it. They don't want it then going out over the internet. Um, and then finally, one of the other issues we, we deal with, and I think we will deal with a lot more in the future is, uh, and this stems from a case uh, out of the Second Circuit involving Cablevision, which is a major cable operator up in the New York area. Um, and it involved what is called network DVR. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Fair enough. Um, it, it's, it's DVR technology, but rather than having a DVR in everybody's home and in everybody's set-top box, the recording occurs way back up in the network. So there's a room full of servers, and the cable operator is doing the recording for you. Okay, so it's a lot more cost-effective, as you can imagine. Instead of having to purchase set-top boxes with DVRs, you can provide the technology way up in the network. 
Uh, that case actually, as I said, went to the Second Circuit because uh, NBCU and a number of others uh, filed suit claiming it was a, a copyright infringement that Cablevision, you know, the, I think it's the old Sony case, Craig, right? It's Sony, the at-home, you know, non-commercial recording. That's fine. You can do that. But this is different. The DVR isn't sitting in the home. It's sitting, I don't know, it could be sitting in Idaho. It doesn't really matter where it's sitting, but it's not in your home. Ultimately, Cablevision prevailed. Um, and just very quickly, why I think they prevailed is because uh, really all they did was extend the DVR. It almost doesn't matter if the DVR is in the home or somewhere else. Anytime a consumer wants to record a program, you, you press record and a recording is made. Does it really matter under the law if the recording resides in your home or if it resides in Idaho? Second Circuit, I guess, said it didn't. Now, here, here's the problem, and, and I think this is why I think we'll be facing this issue a lot more in the future. Um, it's very inefficient the way Cablevision is doing this. Every customer that wants to record presses the record button and a, and a recording is made. So I could press the, re, you know, the record button because I want to watch, uh, you know, I don't know, Desperate Housewives later. My neighbor could press the button too because he wants to watch Desperate Housewives later. Two recordings are made. Terribly inefficient, right? It'd be a lot easier if there were one digital recording that you could just feed out to anybody. So where I think the industry will go with, with network DVR is to essentially attempt to record all programming coming through their system, hold it so that when any customer wants it, they just press the button and it's there. Problem is, I, th I don't think they can do that under copyright law. But that will be an issue that I think will end up, uh, I don't want to say it's going to be litigated. I think it'll end up being negotiated. So um, so let's go back to some of, some of these things that, that, I, that I went through here. Um, so the moving of the, the content around someone's home. That all, I should stay here, I guess. I was going to wander around. Like, you know, anyway. Uh, that all sounds fine, right? And it sounds great, and consumers want it. But, but there are real practical issues associated with that, and, and that is uh, the signal security, right? Once content leaves a network, leaves a system, where's it going? What can you do with it? It's digital, right? I mean, and you can make countless copies of it. And so security and signal security is a, is a real issue. So essentially w the way this is working out is, I mean, there are technologies that you can essentially ensure that if someone wants to move content across a network and in a home or even outside a home for that matter, uh, if that content is flagged with certain controls, that is, you're not allowed to copy this content, right? I mean, you can't, you can't always copy movies. Um, you know, or maybe you're allowed to copy it once, or maybe you're allowed to, you know, copy it freely. There are all sorts of rules that the FCC has essentially adopted for the control of content. Anyway, as long as the equipment that is receiving that content reads that rule and abides by it, then the content ought to be able to float freely throughout the house. And so that's essentially how this is, how this has evolved, and that's, that's really what the parties are negotiating. Um, squeeze backs and overlays, again, that, that all sounds great, and program guides, as I said, are there, and, and you can press a widget button, you can get horoscopes and weather and traffic information, and that all sounds great, consumers want it, but there are real practical issues uh, associated with that from a programmer uh, perspective, and that is um, the overlay is disruptive. And if it's not subscriber initiated, it's really disruptive, right? You're watching something, all of a sudden something pops up on your screen. You guys are seeing that now, right? I mean, you're watching something and the little bug pops up in the corner. It's kind of annoying. Um, now, in that case, it's often the programmer's bug that's popping up. So uh, <laughs> it's not that annoying, right? Um, but you don't want the cable operator popping up information. At least as a programmer, you don't want them to. Um, and then the question is, what is the information that is popping up? Or even through a squeeze back, when you press the button, your screen, sh you know, the picture shrinks. A bunch of data appears here. What is that data? Um, is it competing with what you're offering? If you're ESPN and a bunch of sports scores pop up and they're brought to you by CBS Sports, are you, are you a little bothered by that? Probably ESPN is. Um, another real issue that arises is synchronizing the data that appears in the squeeze back or the overlay with the actual programming, right? I mean, there's, there's metadata that's associated with the programming. So the cable operator knows exactly what you're watching. I mean, if they wanted to peer in, they could see exactly what you're watching. And let's, let's pretend you're watching Bravo, uh, you know, Top Chef. Uh, and you press the little button, screen squeeze back, and uh, some information about how to order a cookbook comes up. Well, that sounds great. Consumers might want it. But if you're Bravo and you're selling that programming and the cable operator is now monetizing your programming and synchronizing, you know, his commercial opportunity with, with your program, you might want a cut of the action on that. So that's, that's an issue there. Um, 
And the other issue, and this is kind of a, a, a practical, you know, this is an advertising related issue, but, but it's very real, and that is the cable operator, again, they have the squeeze back technology, but they sell the squeeze back space. They sell it to, let's say, Coca Cola. But perhaps uh, American Idol is up right now, and American Idol is sponsored by, by well, they're sponsored by Coke. Let's say they, they sponsor the squeeze back by Pepsi, right? I mean, you can see the conflict, and so these are very real issues that have to get hammered out in every negotiation. Uh, and everybody does it differently. There is no common technology for squeeze backs and overlays or what, what cable operators want to do with it. Um, and I'll be honest, I, you know, I have spent weeks on squeeze backs and overlays. I mean, it just, because it's a commercial opportunity for the cable operator. Um, the network DVR, actually, I, let's, I mean, we talked about that, so um, that I think will be an issue that we'll, we'll address more in the future. Um, the on-demand issue, that is uh, negotiated quite heavily as well. On-demand is great. Uh, almost every programmer makes their content available for on-demand viewing, for, for time-shifted viewing. Um, for those of you who have, is it Time Warner here in Cleveland? Okay, I, they probably have 5,000 hours or 10,000 hours of on-demand programming at any one time. Uh, and that's great, all that's been licensed. Um, but one of the problems that, that, that arises is some of that on-demand programming is network programming. When I say network, I mean ABC, NBC, CBS, or Fox. They make their money from advertising, right? Um, and who likes watching commercials? I, I do, but who else likes watching commercials? <laughs> Okay, right, it, it, you know, listen, we all get it. Consumers don't necessarily like watching commercials. And when you watch it on demand, what can you do when the commercial comes up? Exactly, you fast forward it. Well, uh, that doesn't work for a network provider or a network company, right? I mean, they make their money from advertising. Nielsen has constructed a system whereby they will actually count viewing on an on-demand basis if it's viewed within three days of the original airing, and they're hoping to expand that to seven days. So that counts for Nielsen purposes, and it, and, and uh, advertisers want to know, did people see my ad? Um, so some programmers uh, have required that the cable operators disable fast forward or, or skip functionality when watching network programming. As you can imagine, that's heavily negotiated because as a consumer experience, maybe that's not so good. Um, right, you're, you're watching, all of a sudden you hit, and you're like, what's wrong, what's wrong? Before you know it, you're calling your cable operator saying, my fast forward doesn't work. Well, it doesn't work uh, intentionally. So. Um, so, all right, now on the flip side, I, I, and I kind of alluded to these, some of the issues that the cable operators uh, are confronting is the proliferation of the content in, through other platforms, um, on the internet, wireless, whatever it is. So cable operators are often, often asking and negotiating for restrictions on what the programmer can do with the content. That is, if I'm going to pay you, you know, you know in some cases, millions of dollars. I mean, these are, these are multi-year, multi-billion dollar deals. It's, it's real money, it's real business. So if I'm gonna be paying you tens of millions of dollars, I want to know that that programming will not be available uh, over, over the air on a broadcast network, on a broadcast station. I wanna know that you also won't stream it out over the internet. I mean, I essentially want exclusive rights to that. Um, and so that is a heavily, well, I would say negotiated, but it's a heavily fought issue. Um, because the programmer, of course, wants to monetize. They want to make their programming available. So um, with that, that's kind of the, uh, the introduction to, to the issues that, uh, and that's by no means an exhaustive list. I mean, it just, uh, there, there are countless things that come up in the negotiation. As any of you who do transactional work know, I mean, you can't, you can't list it all. But that, that gives you a sense of some of the issues we're dealing with now. So um, now I'm going to turn to these slides, and, and we're going to jump back in time, and we're going to going to go back to the early days of cable. We're going to explore a history of cable television, some of the issues that, that were dealt with, legal regulatory issues that were dealt with along the way. Um, some of those still have application today, and some of them kind of portend some of the issues uh, that we're dealing with now. So you like that simple drawing? I actually did that myself. I'm, I'm kind of proud. That, that took me about two hours. <laughs> so anyway, uh, early cable system. Listen, this is all it was. It was a tower on high ground, it was an antenna, and it was wiring. That was it. And the first cable system, there's a little bit ar of argument over this, but, but uh, the first cable system was in the Poconos in about the mid to late 1940s. And that's literally what you see there um, is, is kind of the early cable system. And all it did was retransmit uh, television signals to areas of the, of the country that could not receive over-the-air broadcast because you know they were too far away, or in this case, mountains uh, you know were in the way. So that was early cable, um, and it was unregulated. 
It was, it was probably regulated at the local level because you probably had to obtain a franchise to wire the streets. Uh, I, you know, the precursor to the FAA, whatever the CAB might have regulated the fact that you want to put a tower up. But other than that, it was not regulated, certainly not at the federal level. Um, that all worked fine until cable operators uh, did this. They introduced microwave, right? So you have here on the left, you have, you know, the original antenna up on the Poconos feeding the houses, you know, in that part of Pennsylvania, but then sending via microwave the signal over to another tower that is then further sending that signal so that you are now sending signals 400 miles away. Um, that sounds kind of, kind of cool if you're one of those people way over here, um, but if you are the station serving that faraway market, you're a little bothered that the cable company is microwaving in a signal. So for example, um, here in Cleveland, you might be able to watch New York television stations, but if you're, the, if you're an owner of a Cleveland-based station, that's, that's a little bothersome. Uh, you're you're uh, essentially diminishing the market. So the FCC got involved at that, at that time, and, and at this time, you know, we're back in the 1960s, the early 60s. Um, broadcast television had a lot of pull, uh, particularly in Washington. Um, and while Congress did not act, they did not step in to regulate this, the, the commission did. So in 1962, um, let's see here. In 1962, the commission jumped in, you know, under the Communications Act, and, you know, it kind of speaks for itself. I mean, that's essentially uh, the relevant portion from the, you know, explaining the purpose of the act. The FCC jumped in and they started regulating cable. Initially, they just regulated uh, those that were using microwave. The rationale being that by using microwave, you are using the airwaves, and the airwaves, as you know, are all licensed and controlled by the FCC. So that was a pretty easy thing for them to do to assert jurisdiction. But, but that was great, but that didn't really uh, solve the problem for the broadcasters. More and more distant signals, and when I say distant, I mean signals that are from out of market, more and more distant signals were being brought into local markets and really harming uh, local television stations. So in 1965, the commission asserted jurisdiction over all cable operators, not just those using microwave. Um, and one of the things that they did in 1965 is they froze. They essentially said no more importation of distant signals. Um, and this was a significant thing, right? The, uh, prior to this, the commission had always said, we, don't, we, don't, we believe that Congress needs to give us authority to regulate cable. And they had not attempted to, to uh, legislate or control in this area. Congress didn't do anything, but you know, because of the, the powerful broadcast lobby and the fact that it was very disruptive to the business model, uh, the FCC did step in. And so as you can imagine, that was challenged. Um, and it was challenged by a cable company in San Diego, I'm sorry, a broadcast station in San Diego uh, that was, a, was bothered by the fact that the cable company was bringing in Los Angeles stations. And so the issue went up to the Supreme Court, and I can't remember if I put this on a slide or not. <coughs> yes, there it is. Um, it went up to the Supreme Court, and essentially the Supreme Court said the FCC does have jurisdiction in this area, that it is ancillary to its obligation and its duty to regulate uh, uh, the broadcast industry and to ensure you know, a communications network. And we could go back to the purpose, but it's from that purpose uh, of the Communications Act that the FCC determined, or I'm sorry, that the Supreme Court determined that the FCC had jurisdiction. Okay, so that ended up, well, at that point, the commission then started asserting a little bit more its, its jurisdiction. So in 1972, it rewrote its 1965 rules, and it now required that all cable operators obtain a certificate of compliance um, before they could even operate or before they could even add a television station, okay? They imposed, and we'll, we'll get into this in a second, but they imposed what were called and what are still called network non-duplication rules and syndicated exclusivity rules, or, or the shorthand is syndex. Um, they also revised their distant signal importation rules, limiting the number that you could bring in. Um, and then they also uh, imposed for the first time what they called must carry, which is you must carry certain signals. And those signals that cable systems had to carry were television signals within 60 miles of the cable television uh, system's uh, head end. And by the way, a head end is the guts of a cable system. It's where they pick up the signals, do whatever it is they do with them, and send them out over their network. So, uh, so let's, let's just kind of pause here for a second. 
up until now, right, the commission's sole focus has been on the preservation of the network broadcast system, right? I mean, it was the primary means, uh, you know, that some of the younger students here probably don't remember. There was a time when all you relied on were, you know, ABC, CBS, NBC. Uh, Fox didn't even exist. Um, and, and that's how we all communicated, and that's how we, we shared information. And so the commission was really focused on the preservation of, of that system, and cable was very disruptive. I mean, it really was. It was, uh, it was drawing away viewership from local stations, which affected advertising revenue. And if you affect advertising revenue, then, then if you're a station, you're not going to stay in business very long if you, don't have, if you can't sell your advertising. Um, so, uh, let me jump back to what I thought one of the, the uh, significant things that came out of that 72 Act was, was his network non, non-dupe, as it's called, and, and syndex. And essentially what it says is that in a television market, excuse me a second, the local television station, if granted the rights by the network or the owner of the syndicated programming, can essentially assert exclusive rights, okay? So essentially within a 35 mile zone uh, around a television station, uh, you know, it's really, uh, it gets too complicated how you measure the 35 miles, but suffice it to say, it's a 35 mile zone. You can assert exclusive rights to network programming and to syndicated programming. So let's see how this works then. Okay, I, I also did this by the way, <laughs> a big black circle. Um, okay. So on the, the black or the brown or whatever it is, that's, assume that's the TV market. It's the 35-mile zone. And assume then that the light blue there, see if that's going to pop up, is the cable franchise area. You can see some overlap, all right? So the cable system, if, if the broadcaster in the brown area asserts network non-duplication rights or syndicated exclusivity rights, that means that the cable operator operating in its franchise area can bring in a duplicating signal, a duplicating network signal. So you have the NBC station in Cleveland. There's an NBC station, I assume, in Youngstown. The cable operator could bring in the Youngstown station, but not in the overlap area, not within that 35-mile zone. Okay? So in that area, the cable operator would have to black out the signal or just not in bring in the signal anywhere. The same applies for syndicated programming. So you purchase your programming from whoever owns it. Uh, they could also grant you exclusive rights within a 35-mile zone. So that did a lot to help preserve the network broadcast system that we know. Um, let's see. At this time, um, oh, here, we'll finish that, that slide. Um, at the time, there was another fight going on, and that involved copyright, all right? So we have signal carriage issues. How many signals can you bring into a market? How do they affect the local stations? Should they have exclusivity? The other issue was copyright, and that is uh, every time a cable system retransmits a broadcast signal, is that a public performance? That was the question, right? Um, if you're a copyright holder, you sure think it is, and you think you ought to be compensated for it. If you're a cable operator, you're saying, no, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna pay you for that. I'm merely retransmitting what's already available over the air. You're getting your, your copyright payment from the broadcaster. Well, this uh, went to the Supreme Court, as you can imagine. And so in 1968, in, in this seminal case, fortnightly, uh, Supreme Court uh, ruled that this was, that the retransmission of a broadcast signal was not a public performance. So it was not an infringement. Um, <clears throat> Well, it didn't stop there. Uh, the, the facts in, in Fortnightly just let's involved, uh, let's say, the, the scenario I painted Cleveland and, and Youngstown, right? I mean, it's not, it's not terribly complicated uh, in that case. But along came, oops, um, let me go back. Along came another case that, in, that was called Teleprompter. I think it was CBS. I think CBS was involved in that case. I can't remember. But in this case, the cable operator was importing the signal from 400 miles away. And so the question was, in that case, because it's not, because the cable operator is not just merely acting as an extension of the broadcaster, right? It's not just merely extending the signal into the market, where the only reason why the customer can't get it is because perhaps there's a building in the way, or perhaps because there's a, there's a small hill or something like that. In this case, I am jumping that signal 400 miles. There is no way the customer was ever intended to get that signal, uh, and they could not get that signal with just a, a routine antenna. Is that a public performance? And again, the Supreme Court said, no, it was not. Um, well, you know, from the cable operator's perspective, that, that ended the debate. Um, 
from the copyright holders perspective that didn't so the fight went on and um, it manifested in the 1976 Copyright Act which I guess rewrote with the 1909 Act or something like that uh, but one of the aspects of that 76 Act was to address this cable situation um, so what uh, what Section 111 did, I mean, and it only applies to cable operators, by the way, who are operating cable systems as defined under, uh, under copyright law, but essentially what it did is it set up a compulsory scheme, okay? So if you are a cable operator operating a cable system, then you must comply with this statute, um, and you, you essentially pay into a fund that the Copyright Office collects, and then they distribute money to the, uh, to the copyright holders. Um, Essentially, what it, it, it recognized that local retransmission of broadcast signals, and when I say local, the Cleveland station being retransmitted by the cable operator in the Cleveland market, that that wasn't a public performance. But Congress decided that the importation, right, the 400 mile thing, or even the 75 mile uh, bringing in of distant signals, constituted a public performance. And so for those distant signals, cable operators now pay uh, into a copyright fund that is then distributed to copyright holders. And I will say Section 111 is really, really archaic, and it is really complicated, and it's very much premised on the FCC's signal carriage rules that we talked about uh, from 1972. None of those rules are in effect anymore, and they're all gone, um, and yet the Copyright Act still depends upon them, and how you calculate how much you owe is very much dependent upon knowing those rules from 1972. And, and I happen to be fortunate enough to have some sense of how they work, but I, I, I'm not kidding when I say there are probably 100 lawyers in America that actually know how it works, and, and those still have tattered copies of their 1972 rules, because you really have to consult them, um, and, and you can't find them anywhere. You either have the tattered copy or you don't. Um, so if anybody practices in that area, that's great. <laughs> um, okay, so. In 1970, I can't remember what it was, 75, 73, something like that, um, HBO was launched and cable then changed dramatically. It was the first satellite service available and overnight cable exploded. And it was, you know, at that time frame that I'm sure Cleveland and all of the you know, municipalities around here started getting franchised and you started getting cable television service. Um, let me just note though, uh, and we won't delve into a lot of detail here, but in 1984, Congress passed the first uh, Cable Act. And that Cable Act gave the FCC primary jurisdiction over cable. So it was no longer this ancillary jurisdiction that essentially the jurisdiction was limited to the extent that cable affected broadcast. Now it was primary jurisdiction. Um, everything was fine. 1984 was a fairly deregulatory act. Um, and cable exploded, right? I mean, everybody started getting cable by then. Um, but then in 1992, Congress stepped in again and uh, adopted the 1992 Cable Act which was anything but deregulatory. Uh, and, and really this came from a lot of consumer complaints. I mean, people were upset about their customer service, they were upset about the, uh, uh, the high cost of cable. And so Congress stepped in and just incidentally, it was the, uh, it was the only, uh, I think it was, it was adopted at the end of uh, George Bush the, the first, uh, the end of his presidency. It was the only legislation that he vetoed that was overridden. Uh, so you can, you can see that, that people were a little upset with their cable operator back then, and Congress was responding. And does anybody remember, you know, the, the complaints and about how poor the customer service was and how, how high the rates were? Well, uh, that's what the 1992 Act was intended to, uh, to address. Um, that's when I graduated from law school, and so I started under the 1992 Cable Act, and I can tell you it was a mess. It was really a mess. Uh, um, there was a lot of rate regulation in there, and it just, it, let's just be glad that it's gone. Um, it was just a very, very difficult piece of legislation. So um, one of the aspects, though, of the 1992 uh, Cable Act was to impose, remember we talked about in 1972, must carry, right? You must carry the signals of stations that are within a 60-mile zone. Um, that was actually, and I didn't get into this, but that was challenged uh, and it was thrown out. Uh, it was found to be unconstitutional. The FCC imposed new must carry rules. They were also thrown out. In 1992, Congress now stepped in and imposed uh, a must carry obligation. That survived challenge uh, and was upheld by the Supreme Court in a five to four decision uh, in 19, I can't remember, 94 or something like that. But must carry essentially said, and, and its companion was something called retransmission consent. And so let me just explain how this works. Um, 
every three years, and that can be extended or shortened by negotiation, but every three years, a cable operator, I'm sorry, a broadcast station, can either assert must carry, that is you say to the cable operators within your television market, you must carry my signal. Or you can say, you cannot carry my signal unless you negotiate with me, unless you get my consent, right? So you either are going to carry me or you're not going to carry me, but you gotta get my permission. You can, you can probably quickly figure out it, the smaller, weaker stations, the independent stations, they all sort of must carry, right? They want to be on the cable systems. Um, the stronger stations, the ABC, the NBC, CBS, Fox, uh, they assert retransmission consent. And so uh, out of that come negotiations. And for about the first 15 years, the negotiations were pretty straightforward. Um, and it's been in the last four or five years that the negotiations have become really, really nasty. I don't know if, if in, in the last couple of years you had any signals come off cable systems in the Cleveland area. But it's happening now. Uh, did you in this area? Okay, almost, right. They are getting really nasty. The, the, um, the, the broadcast stations facing a lot of competition from cable, from satellite, from wireless, they're losing audience, right? I mean, you just have to look at the Nielsen reports and see that over the air free broadcast television is losing audience. Um, and so one, other, one way to make up for that is to charge a fee. Charge the cable operator some fee to retransmit the signal. Cable operators, because for about 15 years they never paid anything, I mean the negotiations just, you know, everything was fine, everybody was happy. Um, they're not accustomed to paying. And it's expensive. Uh, I'm not disclosing anything when I say, I think it was Disney or CBS saying, we're going to get a dollar. We're going to get a dollar from every subscriber every month. If you want to see, I think it was, I think it was uh, the ABC stations, it might have been Fox. That's a lot of money. That's $12 a year from every customer. And in the cable world, because of the way that the, the cable laws work, everybody gets broadcast television stations. I mean, that's a, the minimum. When you buy cable, you will get a package that includes broadcast television stations. And so 100% of your customer base gets it. They may not ever watch it, but they get it. Um, and the stations want a dollar a month from every single one of those folks. Now, if ABC, CBS, NBC, and Fox all want a dollar, you know, right? You're now talking $50 a month for retransmission of broadcast signals. So you can see why the negotiations have gotten really ugly. I, up in New York just last year, uh, I think it was ABC that carried the Academy Awards last year. ABC came off a cable system, a major cable system in the New York market. So instantly lost 3 million customers. Now that's painful to the broadcaster, right? I mean, that's a lot of advertising that, that's being, in, in, being impacted. It's painful to the cable operator. They don't wanna lose uh, their customers. Uh, and the signal came off. And it went back on six minutes after the Academy Awards started. I mean, that was, you know. So these things go down to the wire. The Super Bowl is often a point of leverage. Um, so the, the, the negotiations have become very, very, very contentious of late. So um, let's, uh, I think we can skip this. We kind of talked about, about this. But let me just point out one, one thing, because we will come back to this. Um, Notice retransmission consent. It says no cable system or other multi-channel video programming distributor, okay, MVPD. Um, and we'll get to the definition of MVPD in a second. But notice the difference between must carry and retrans. Retransmission consent applies to cable operators. Uh, I'm sorry, must carry applies to cable operators. Retransmission consent applies to MVPDs, okay? That's, and we're gonna, that, that we'll come back to in a second. So, um, but I wanted to point that out. So, now you guys have kind of a, a, a background of sorts in cable or signal carriage issues, must carry retransmission consent, syndex, network non-duplication, that kind of stuff. A little bit background in, in copyright. So now let's fast forward to cases that have arisen in the last like three or four months, okay? Is anybody familiar with, there are two companies, one's called Film On and the other one's called Ivy, I-V-I. Does anybody know what they are? Okay. Um, two interesting companies that just literally sprang up, caught a lot, of peop a lot of people by surprise. What they do is they retransmit broadcast signals over the internet. Kind of like the old microwave relay systems, they are sending signals anywhere you want, anywhere in the United States. So for $4.95 a month, if you sign up for Ivy or Film On, you could watch broadcast signals from, I think Ivy is based in Seattle, so they carry the Seattle stations. You can watch Seattle stations if you want. 
Um, but they could pick up any signal anywhere they want and send it out over the internet. As you can imagine, it didn't take long for the broadcasters and copyright holders to file suit. Um, and uh, I don't know how this will play out. I will say this. I mean, it's probably looking good for the broadcasters and cable operators because both of those companies are now subject to TROs. And so they're not uh, distributing their service across the country. They are not retransmitting signals on the internet. Um, but let's kind of look at, look at the issue. What, you know, what, what were Ivy and Philmon's arguments? Why, why could they do this? Uh, to them, the answer was easy. I, I am subject to Section 111. I am a cable system as defined under copyright law. Therefore, all I have to do is pay a fee into the copyright office. They will then distribute it. That's all I need to do. I said, I'm not an MVPD. I am not a cable operator, so I'm not subject to must carry, and I'm not subject to retransmission consent most, you know, most importantly, because were they subject to retransmission consent, then of course they would have no right to distribute these signals without the broadcast station's permission, okay? Um, this is interesting because, right, the Copyright Act was written in 1976. It didn't contemplate the internet. It didn't contemplate all this stuff. It was written for, for an environment in which you had discrete, geographically confined cable systems that were retransmitting over-the-air broadcast signals. Uh, it, was, it was all very simple. It didn't contemplate internet delivery of signals, you know, thousands of miles away, or for that matter, anywhere in the world. Um, and so it's not clear how this is going to play out uh, uh, you know, as, as the litigation proceeds. The, um, the Register of Copyrights back in 2000 essentially said that she believed that anybody streaming over the internet, stre streaming a retransmission of broadcast signal, needs to obtain some other form of licensing, some other right. In other words, it is not available under Section 111. But that's just her opinion. Uh, now, courts might show her some deference, but, uh, but the answer is not clear. So. Um, Interestingly, and one of the points that, uh, that plaintiffs have made in this case, is that when DirecTV and Echostar Dish uh, first launched their service, right, their nationwide satellite service, they took advantage of Section 111. Um, they were sued, right? It, uh, and I can't, let's see here. Yeah. Uh, no, sorry. Did I, did I already give you, I can't remember if I gave you the definition of cable system under under uh, the Copyright Act, but if not, anyway, they claim that they were a cable system under the Copyright Act. Uh, they lost that, right? And, and the reasoning was that, again, the act was written in 1976. It did not contemplate a nationwide service. It contemplated distributing signals in a confined or defined geographic area, not a national platform. Fast forward to Ivy and Film On, and it's almost, it's analogous. They want to distribute signals nationally, not in any kind of a defined geographic area. And so I think in the end, Section 111, if, if it's consistent with, if, you know, the court is consistent in how they handle DirecTV and DISH, I think they will find that Section 111 does not apply. But, but uh, more on that later. We'll, we'll see how that plays out. Um, so. One of the other aspects of, uh, let me just, one of the other aspects of Section 111 is that it contemplates that uh, the party availing itself of this compulsory license is in compliance with the FCC signal carriage rules. That is, must carry, retransmission consent, syndex, net network non-duplication. Um, because remember, it's all tied into those carriage rules from 1972. Ivy and Film On presumably are not subject or, or are not allowing themselves to be subject to network non-duplication or syndicated exclusivity, and as I said, must carry and retransmission consent. So again, I think Philmon and Ivy will probably lose in the end, uh, but it's interesting because it essentially presents the same issues uh, that were being dealt with back in the 1960s, 1970s. The only thing that's different is the means of transmission of that signal. It's the internet rather than a microwave relay system. Here, so here, uh, now this is under the, uh, the Cable Act, um, and I just want to share with you some of these, some of these definitions, um, because I'm, then, I'm now going to talk about a, another case that kind of relates to this. So here's a definition of a cable operator. A cable operator is one who essentially operates a cable system. You all have this, by the way, so you don't, I'm not going to make you read all this. An MVPD, remember we talked about MVPD. So that is what a multi-channel video program distributor is. And now look at that definition, though, it is interesting. Uh, is an entity such as, but not limited to. So it's open-ended. Who is an MVPD? 
uh, as written, it's cable operator, a BRS or EBS, and, and that stands for, I think it's broadband radio service and educational broadband service, and that's a wireless service. Uh, a direct broadcast satellite service, television receive only, those are those big satellite dishes that, you, that people used to have in their backyards. Yeah, okay. Um, or a satellite master antenna television uh, system, and, and otherwise known as a SMAT fee. And what those are, you know, when you go to a hotel and, and you can watch cable, they probably have a small satellite dish in the back somewhere, and that's called a SMAT fee system. You often find them in apartment buildings as well. Um, so here, here are the pertinent definitions. Now, I share this with you uh, because a recent case arose last April, and it involved Discovery Networks and Sky Angel. Um, Sky Angel is a service that was a satellite service, uh, much like DISH or DirecTV, and they delivered their programming, you know, nationally. Uh, well, I don't think it was national, actually, because they, they, I think they were a little more limited in their scope, but let's just say to a, a good portion of the country. Um, at some point, Sky Angel started delivering its services over the Internet. Now, it wasn't free streaming over the Internet. Not anybody could get it. Only their customers could get it. But they changed from satellite delivery to, uh, to Internet delivery. Discovery, uh, at some point, discovered this uh, and sent a letter to Sky Angel and said, you were in breach of your agreement. I, we negotiated for your right to distribute my programming via your satellite platform. You're now distributing it over the Internet. You do not have those rights um, and notified them that they were going to be terminating their agreement. Sky Angel went to the FCC um, and you know, filed a complaint. Essentially what they sought from the FCC was, was a standstill order, essentially like a, a TRO from from an administrative agency. Um, they did not file an, 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 a, what is called a program access complaint. And what a program access complaint is, I will tie all this together. I know I'm throwing a lot at you, but it'll all tie together. A program access complaint um, is essentially a complaint that a programmer is denying you access, you, the, the cable operator, the satellite provider, denying access to the programming. These program access rules uh, they're a little more narrow than that. They're actually only applicable to cable programmers who are vertically integrated with cable operators or satellite providers. Okay, so if you, uh, NBCU is now vertically integrated with Comcast. Comcast is a cable operator, NBCU is a programmer. They are now vertically integrated. NBCU programming is now subject to program access rules, which means essentially that if an MVPD, right, it's not a cable operator, it's an MVPD, is an M if an MVPD seeks access to NBCU's programming, NBCU has to abide by certain rules, which essentially makes it very difficult for them to deny access to that programming. Um, Non-vertically integrated programmers, by the way, are not subject to program access. So <coughs> one month ago, NBCU was not subject to program access. Now they are. So um, anyway, so Sky Angel filed this complaint, kind of fashioned as a program access complaint, but really a, uh, a standstill order. And the FCC found that Sky Angel was not, uh, could not avail itself of the program access rules because it did not distribute uh, multiple channels. Channels, right? It distributed, from a consumer perspective, it's distributing hundreds of channels. But from a definitional perspective, it's not a channel. A channel, believe it or not, is still defined as six megahertz of spectrum. Or you know, it, so it's a yeah, it's it's kind of a technicality. Uh, but it's it's going to have a lot of repercussions as we move forward, and and we'll get to that. Like, what is an MVPD? If it's not an internet distributor, because they're not distributing channels, uh, is it really just limited to cable and satellite and 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 those you know maybe even the telcos uh, and you know. Arguably, are the telcos delivering channels when they deliver their signal via internet protocol? I don't know the answer to that. Um, and the commission uh, certainly hasn't shared with us what the answer is. As a matter of fact, uh, back in 2007, another internet startup called VDC, a video, I can't remember what it stood for, out of Chicago, uh, went to Turner Broadcast, I'm sorry, uh, to CNN, the then Time Warner, and asked to uh, license TNT, TBS, Headline News, CNN, because they wanted to distribute the service over the internet to their paying customers. It wasn't free streaming, you know, broad internet distribution. It was to paying customers. Uh, and Time Warner said no. VDC filed a program access complaint because at the time, Time Warner was vertically integrated, right? There's Time Warner Cable, there's Time Warner Programming. The two are now separate, so they're no longer vertically integrated. But they filed a complaint back in 2007, and the commission did what commissions do when they don't know the answer to something. They did nothing. 
You know, there is no, there is no obligation that you rule on a program access complaint. There are, uh, they say that they strive to, uh, to address them within nine months, but they did nothing. VDC ended up going out of business. So they didn't have to answer the question on VDC, but they have to answer the question uh, with Sky Angel, and I think they have answered it. They've said, you're not offering channels, but, but that doesn't really suffice. Um, so about two weeks ago, three weeks ago, DirecTV uh, filed a letter to the, at the commission. Uh, there, there are some other proceedings going on at the commission that involve MVPDs, and one of them is what is called all vid. And essentially what the all vid docket is, is essentially an effort to make all communications platforms, satellite, cable, and all the equipment you use, your television, your DVR, whatever it is, make it all communicate seamlessly. For those of you who have tried to hook up a bunch of different boxes and all that, it doesn't always work very well. Uh, were you and I talking about cable cards earlier or someone? I was talking to someone about cable cards. That was an earlier effort to try and make it all work seamlessly together, and, and the commission abandoned that. They're now pursuing this thing called AllVid. Uh, but the AllVid rules apply to MVPDs. So the question is, if you know Comcast and DirecTV and DISH and AT&T and all these others, these traditional distributors have to comply with these rules, what about Netflix? What about Amazon? What about Apple? Do they have to comply? Are they MVPDs? And so DirecTV has filed this letter saying to the commission, don't go any further. Don't, don't impose rules on us if you haven't quite figured out what our competitors are. Um, so that remains to be seen, and, I, and I, I, it'll be interesting to see how they rule on, on that. Um, this is a statement from, from a gentleman by the name of Landall Hobbs, who then was the chief operating officer of Time Warner. Um, and you can see what he's saying about online distribution of video. We've got to be careful, right? I mean, that's, and that's how the cable operators feel about this. Uh, we got to be careful. Um, and there are a lot of reasons for that. I mean, uh, listen, I don't know what consumer satisfaction is with cable operators, but you probably hear people complain about their cable operators as much as they do about their phone company, right? Um, and so if you could get your video over the Internet, um, perhaps at the same cost, perhaps a little bit more, would you switch? Probably many of you would. Um, and so if you're a cable operator, you're concerned. Um, but you're even more concerned because how is that, how is that uh, video provider getting the content to you? Well, they're riding over the lines that, that Time Warner and others paid for and they <coughs> built and they, and they maintain going into your house. So their cost structure is entirely different. If you're Netflix and you have a server farm in you know, Silicon Valley and you can serve the entire country, uh, at a fraction of the cost of the cable operators and the satellite providers, it's not going to take long before the satellite and cable operators are losing their customers. And I don't know. I don't know where it ends. I don't want to say they're going out of business, but uh, it's a real threat. Um, so that's what I think this, this Mr. Hobbs was getting at. But now um, let's jump ahead to the Comcast NBCU order. All right, stemming out of the Comcast's acquisition of NBCU. Um, with a vertically integrated NBCU, right, you have a major programmer that owns 15, 20 cable networks, and you have the largest cable operator in America with 23 million subscribers. Getting them together, you know, theoretically, Comcast has a lot of reason not to make its programming available to online providers. Uh, you know, right, why do you want your provide your programming to the very person who's going to steal your customer, all right? Uh, I'm not saying that's how they behave. I'm just, you know, it doesn't take a lot to figure out that there are a lot of incentives not to make the programming available. So, but the FCC and, and the Department of Justice, by the way, there was a consent decree in, in this merger also that largely mirrors what the FCC did, uh, but it's limited to the online video distributors. Um, the FCC and Department of Justice were very concerned about how Comcast might behave vis-a-vis -vis the online providers. And so really, the, the, there, there are a lot of commitments that are in there that Comcast made and a lot of requirements, um, you know, that they have to maintain their television network, you know, NBC network for some period of time. They can't do a lot of other things. But really, the guts of it, I think, is, is right here. It's how Comcast slash NBCU is going to have to treat online video providers. And there's a lot here. Um, and these are the definitions, and you all have uh, the, the language before you, but essentially it makes it very difficult 
for NBCU to deny its programming to online video distributors, okay? Um, it goes a step further than that. It, it says not only if you are making your programming available to an MVPD, you must also make that programming available to online distributors, provided, of course, they have the financial resources to purchase it. Um, but it also says if an online video distributor does a deal with, and there, I, there are about four other programmers, I think it's Walt Disney Company, uh, Fox, Viacom, and maybe Turner. But if an online video distributor does a deal with the Disney Company for all of Disney's product, ESPN, ESPN2, 3, whatever it happens to be, um, Disney Channel, then that online video distributor can come to NBCU and say, you have to essentially give me the same deal for comparable programming on economically equivalent terms. Now, there's some definition around what economically equivalent is, but there are going to be a lot of fights in that area, a lot of fights. Um, so think about that. Your competitor, NBCU's competitor, can define the deal that NBCU needs to do with the OVD that is going to be taking customers from your owner. I mean, it's, uh, listen, from a consumer perspective, this might be great. Right? It, might, it might really foster uh, the growth of internet delivered video, uh, but it has real repercussions on big companies that employ a lot of people. Uh, and, and I was talking last night with Craig and, and some others, and you know, I don't know how this will all play out, but, but I think there's a social impact to all of this, right? From a consumer perspective, great. I can now get video from an internet provider. I don't have to go to my cable company or my satellite guy. The internet provider doesn't even need to be, have a local presence in my community. It might be serving me content from California. Uh, the cost might be a lot lower because they don't have the infra infrastructure to maintain, but there's a social impact. Cable companies and satellite providers employ a lot of people. They maintain offices in many, you know, almost every municipality. Uh, they pay 5% of their, at least the cable operators, 5% of their gross revenue goes to all munici every municipality in which they serve customers. Um, you know, there's, they have to maintain a network in, in, in the rights of way. Uh, now think of someone coming over the top, using that network to deliver the video at a much different cost structure. I don't know. Right? I mean, what happens to the 5% of gross revenues that gets paid to the municipality? In the city of Chicago, that's tens of millions of dollars a year. A year. Is Netflix going to replace that? Probably not. Um, you know, the people that they employ to install cable and to deliver your set-top box, is Netflix going to have someone? No, there's no need to because you just plug your broadband connection into the back of your TV set. So I think the real social implications to all of this um, that will play out, and I don't know that they've been thought through, but it really doesn't matter because the FCC has acted, uh, the Department of Justice has, has acted, and I think uh, you know the doors are now open. I mean, it's, uh, I think we're going to see, I think this will foster a lot more online delivery uh, of video programming. So um, now we can probably skip through this. This, there are other, other provisions in here essentially uh, limit what NBCU can do with respect to its, its programming agreements. Um, it forces or requires that NBCU continue to make its content available to Hulu. Uh, I don't know if you all are familiar with Hulu. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, Hulu is an online provider of video. It's, it's a fabulous site. It's partially owned by NBCU, uh, and it's a great site, and it aggregates a lot of content across a, from a lot of programmers. Uh, and if you haven't visited Hulu, visit Hulu. Um, <laughs> it, it really is a great site. Um, and then finally, if negotiations fail, it's, it's baseball-style arbitration. And if you all know what that is, it's essentially each party comes to the table. Um, you, you give your last, final, best offer, and the arbitrator picks one of them. There's no, you know, negotiating. There's, you know, uh, so it, it presumably incentivizes everybody to come to the table with a reasonable offer for fear that if your offer is so outrageous, you're going to lose and you're going to live with the other guy's offer. Um, and I think that's it. Um, and so I welcome any questions. Uh,
I'm just curious as to what extent your ind industry and perhaps more importantly the court concern themselves with the issues of sustainability as far as technology, limiting energy consumption, what's the most energy efficient way to do this, and limiting um, physical waste. Like you mentioned, the, the difference between just plugging in something versus multiple boxes. Yeah. That's something you concern yourselves with, and how much do the courts look at that? Um, you know, I, I suppose that might be a factor, um, but do I look at that? Do I personally look at that in, on a daily basis? I'll be honest, I don't. Um, that's not to say that it isn't a part of, of the overall policy development of the company, uh, but, but it's not something that I, I would address on a, on a regular basis. Nick, would you mind uh, just queuing up with the microphone? Just please, uh, if you don't mind coming down and asking your questions. Yes, with yes, that, that's fine. That'll, that'll be very helpful. Thank you. Okay. Um, Yes, you, you mentioned uh, ab about a quarter of the way through your talk something about uh, how the cable company knows whether or not customers are, are, are watching advertisements. Uh, there there ha have also been statements uh, such as uh, more people many more people watch Fox News than, than watch NBC at, at, at 8 p.m. at prime time. People per, prefer O'Reilly to, to Rachel Maddow. But it's, it, it's like, uh, isn't this monitoring of, uh, uh, of what the, the cable consumer watches, uh, isn't this a, a, a violation of privacy? Well, what, what I said, and I hope I, I said it, and if I didn't, I'll make that clear, they could, right? Um, you're absolutely right. There are federal laws in place that restrict uh, consumer privacy, and just about every state in the country has privacy regulations. And so I'm not aware of any cable company actually monitoring viewership. Could they know? Yeah, the technology is there. It certainly is there, but they don't, as far as I know. And so all the, you know, whatever data they have on viewership is all derived from Nielsen, where people have volunteered to become a Nielsen home. You mentioned that it was difficult to stop online distribution of videos, and so maybe I'm confused about this MVPD definition, but at, one, at what point will the internet be incorporated in the definition? And when I, do I don't know. I mean, that's, that's, that's a big question, right? It's, uh, uh, presumably is not right now, right? I mean, the Sky Angel case essentially said you're not offering channels of programming um, and you're not, def you're not confined to a geographic area. You're, you're not an MVPD. Um, maybe that's good, maybe that's bad. I mean, on the one hand, they can't avail themselves of program access rules, so that, that's harmful. And yet there are a number of other regulations that are, that are imposed upon MVPDs that presumably would not be imposed on a Sky Angel or another internet provider. So I think the commission has to resolve this. I mean. The, the internet video providers are coming, right? I mean, we already have Netflix and Amazon and, and uh, Apple, but we're gonna get more, right? I mean, with this order, there, excuse me, there will be more, and I think the commission has to resolve what is an MVPD and are these internet providers, are they subject to these rules? Um, or Congress is gonna have to step in and legislate be, because it doesn't make sense to have two parties competing for the very same customer and be subject to very divergent rules. One essentially subject to no rules, uh, and one subject to a, to a host of rules. It just seems so counterproductive since it's not incorporated in the definition, but yet they can't stop them from distributing it online. And I know so many people who don't pay for cable because they can watch all of their shows. And yeah, right. I mean, it's a, you know, right. I mean, this is where the legislation has not kept up with the change in technology. Thank you. You mentioned antitrust considerations, at least as far as the merger office is concerned. But on a day-to-day -day basis, is the programmer subject to price discrimination, tying rules, and the rest of the... Budget. Yes, yeah, those, those antitrust rules still apply. I mean, they're not somehow supplanted by these other program access rules, or so, so, so uh, uh, antitrust rules always apply. And in fact, I, I will tell you, I mean, on, I, I shouldn't say on a daily basis, but yeah, that is something that, that we take into consideration, or that I have taken into consideration in prior negotiations. Uh, you know, you're obviously trying to sell uh, all of your programming services and someone says to you, I, I don't want this one. 
you know, you, you have to think of tying, okay, it's, can I force them to take it, you know? Um, so yeah, that, that's a regular component of, of, you know, all these negotiations. Anything else? Gentleman here. America. <laughs> <laughs> I think, uh, you know, I, it's just my, my personal view is, I think probably one of the, one of the <coughs> things we need to reconsider is whether it makes sense to regulate cable at a local level. Um, and should it be regulated at a more national level or perhaps a state level? And should all providers then be regulated at that higher level? You know, does it make sense that the city of Cleveland, the city of Shaker Heights, and all these others have a say in how Time Warner operates in that community? On the one hand, it does because they are using the rights of way. I mean, that's, that's, that's a fact, and so they do have some hook into them, but should they be more constrained and somehow, you know, FCC or, you know, some other authority at a more national level regulate everybody alike? All right, thanks so much. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs>